started. And um, let's see here. Okay, so um, just as the sort of audio test, can you just uh, say your name for me? Jenna Cordaro. Cordaro. Okay, I just want to make sure that I'm getting that right. Perfect. Um, okay, so yeah, Jenna, I saw a little bit of your story. Already really excited to be able to share it with people. Um, wanted to start with uh, the first part of it is the pre treatment, right? So, like what you noticed. Uh, your symptoms, and then things before you started the actual treatment. So I'm going to ask you specific questions throughout. Um, so don't worry about like, you know, saying the whole entire story in one time. Um, I'll just sort of guide you along. So, mm -hmm. so the first question I have for you is, you know, what were your first symptoms? Like when were you noticing something was wrong and what were those first sort of symptoms? So I had noticed that I had a very hoarse um voice going hold on we have to start over <laughs> oh and by the way if you um like stutter or mess up like don't worry about having a perfect answer it's just a conversation i'm so. just looking at myself and i just want to fix my hair i'm so oh, sorry. sure no problem well mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, Jenna, when did you notice something was wrong and what were those symptoms? So about six months before I had found out that I had cancer, um, one of my main symptoms was that my voice was extremely hoarse and not the kind of hoarse when you wake up and you feel a little groggy and you have to clear your throat. Like I would speak and my voice would go in and out and it would actually sometimes really hurt to talk. And another really alarming symptom that I had was um, I had a lymph node on this side of my neck that was protruding like out of my skin. And I would constantly shake it off because um, a few times when I was younger, I had um, a, a mono and I had thought, oh, you know what? It's just a little flare up of mono. It's really not a big deal just because I am I was always on the go. I, I, I worked a lot, um, always hanging out with friends, um, commuting back and forth um, from Manhattan. So I shrugged it off until, you know, one day I had said to myself, I have thyroid problems in my family, not necessarily cancer, but um, hypothyroidism, um, Graves disease. So I said to myself, I might as well just go get this all checked out. So that's what led me to go to the doctor. Okay. Um, so how long were you experiencing that before it really got you to go, you know what, I should just go to the doctor? I would say I felt those symptoms for about six months, but it was in the last two when like I really started to get nervous because I would, you know, feel the lymph node in my neck and I'd be like, oh, I don't think that's supposed to be as prominent as it is right now. So let's go get that checked out kind of thing. Good, and I'm glad you went and, and you finally went. So what do you remember of that first trip to the doctors? So my first trip to the doctor, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't very nervous because like I said, I have thyroid problems in my family. My mom um, has an underactive thyroid. So she basically coached me through the whole thing. She's like, well, you're gonna go to the endocrinologist. They're gonna do this, this, and that. And this was her doctor that I had went to. So I went in, you know, like very confident, just thinking, oh, there's just something wrong with my thyroid because I was also gaining um, weight um, a little bit. And when I went in, I was fine. I gave them my insurance card, gave them the copay, you know, la di da. I was reading a book, waiting. And then um, even the doctor himself that had examined me was like, you know, your thyroid is a little enlarged, but I wouldn't say it's anything, but I just want you to go get a sonogram just in case. So again, still confident, you know, because it had happened to my mom, it had happened to a cousin of mine where they've went and got these sonograms and it was nothing, you know, everything was benign. So again, I was pretty happy-go-lucky going into it. Okay, perfect. So can you walk us through the steps of, so you're at the doctor's, he's like, okay, he just sort of did a physical exam on mm -hmm. the outside and then he's like, okay, you need to get an ultrasound. Is it an ultrasound or a sonogram, I guess is the same. So it's, um, they kind of use those terms um, interchangeably. The true medical term is that it is an ultrasound. Um, 
which, you know, a lot of people think ultrasound, oh, you're having a baby kind of thing, but you can really get um, ultrasounds of anything. So I had went for the ultrasound. I would say I went to the doctor on December 12th uh, of 2017, and then I went for the sonogram um, that Thursday. So that was about two days apart. And I went super early in the morning before I went to work. And um, I just thought that maybe the sonogram tech wasn't in a good mood, but her face was just very alarming the whole time. But I was just like, oh, you know what, it's 7 a.m. Maybe she's still quiet or something like that. Again, not really thinking that it was anything serious, which it turned out to be, but. Right. Um, and so what was that process of the ultrasound? Because you're right. People usually think of, oh, you're pregnant. We just <laughs> want, you know, uh, what was the ultrasound process like? Did it, uh, it was painless, right? And painless, um, just sticky because they use all of that gel to, um, move the wand. I'm not really sure what the actual medical term for it is, but to move the, um, wand instrument across the area that they're looking at. So pretty painless, just like I said, it was seven o'clock in the morning. It definitely felt longer than it actually was because I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, I got to get this over with. I have to go, um, to work. It's, you know, I, I want to get on the bus. I want to get, um, into Manhattan. But I would say from start to finish, it was about like 25 minutes. Um, again, I'm looking at the screen and I don't know what I'm looking at. So it was, again, I wasn't very worried, but at the same time, I was just a little confused about what was going on. Because like I said, I've never had a sonogram, let alone like on my neck area. Right. And, and so how long did it take to get the actual results and what, you know, what happened? So funny story. Um... I had called my doctor, uh, the doctor that um, ordered the test, I had called him on December 22nd um, of, two, of 2017, and I left a message for him, and I said, you know, um, I know it's right around the holidays, but I'd really like to know the results of my um, ultrasound, just to put my mind at ease, because at this point, it's like I started looking up, you know, um, lymph node and neck and, you know, hoarseness of the voice. So I was really starting to kind of freak myself out of what it could be. And I was, tr I stopped putting off the no news is good news thing. So I just said, you know what, let me just give him a call. So like I said, I left the message and he had called me back about two hours later. And I was at the tree in Bryant Park in Manhattan with my boyfriend when um, <clears throat> when my endocrinologist had called me and told me, you know, the, the ultrasound came back a little suspicious. Um, he said to me, you have about two or three nodules on your thyroid that I need to get biopsy. Again, saying 95% of the time, these nodules come out benign. So I'm really not worried for you. So naturally, I'm saying to myself, I'm freaking out because I've never had a, a biopsy before. So my next order of business was after the holidays, I was to get a fine needle biopsy of three spots on my neck, in the middle, the left, and the right. And that's when I had to take the next, the next step of going to the pathologist to get the fine needle biopsy, which... Actually, it was kind of painful. I would say that was probably one of the more painful parts that I had to go through. Yeah, because there, if you could actually describe that. So your, so your doctor is telling you on the phone that he's going to need biopsies, right, of three mm -hmm. locations. Um, how long did it take? Was it, was it that doctor who was going to do it or somebody else? And how long did it take to get that appointment? So... I had spoken to the endocrinologist on December 22nd, and because the holidays were coming up Christmas, um, he said, you know, you're going to have to wait until after the holiday. So again, like I'm, I'm freaking out. I couldn't really even enjoy my Christmas because of it, but um, there's much worse things in life I know, but at the time you're like, oh, it's Christmas. I'm so bummed because I'm thinking about having to get a biopsy two days later. But um, I actually had to go to a different doctor. I had to go to a pathologist. Um, that specializes in the fine needle um, aspiration. That's what they call what I needed. And 
I had gone there on December 27th. So I actually got the appointment fairly quickly, like considering the time frame of the 22nd to the 27th and having uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day in between that. Um, so that was great that I was able to go in pretty quickly. And the ironic part was that when I went for the, um, for the biopsy with my mom, the first thing that we saw in the office was this magazine that had thyroid um, awareness month, which was coming up in January. So that's when I started to get this feeling. I'm like, okay, like this, th there's too many signs. Like there's something like that that's wrong here. Right. No. And it, it's happening pretty fast. Although you said you had seen the endocrinologist December 12th, mm -hmm. right? And then you did the actual ultrasound. Three days uh, later. Right. Three days later. So 12, 13, 14. So it was 12, the December 15th. And you didn't find out for a week, basically. You had to call the endocrinologist. Yeah. He didn't even, um, did he describe why he didn't call or <laughs> did the results take that long? Just he's, you know, I, I don't want to say anything bad. He's not my doctor anymore, but, um, maybe it was just a thing. Like there's unfortunately a stigma around thyroid cancer and thyroid issues that because it's not necessarily as deadly as other things that it's not as important sometimes is kind of the feeling that you get in, in my community, which stinks, but um, I mean, it, it is what it is. Okay. Yeah. Maybe we'll dive into that later. Cause I've heard that from other, you know, thyroid, um, cancer, you know, patients and, and survivors who have del delved into that. So, um, okay. So you're about to go into your fine needle aspirations appointments. Can you describe that process? I mean, people might get a little freaked out. Uh, uh if you could just walk us through, just tell it, you know, how it happened. So I was with my mom because my mom is one of my best friends. Um, I actually chose going for the biopsy with my mom um, over my boyfriend. <laughs> but um, so basically we sat in the office and what freaked me out initially and what still kind of makes me a little uneasy sometimes is that I'm always the youngest person in the office. And can, I mean, I'm not that young. I'm 26 years old, but there's such a there's such a stigma around cancer sometimes that that you're older and you know you're in your middle age so it it was just very odd being the only younger person in in the room so that immediate that immediately made me feel a little uneasy with the magazine that was on the desk that had like highlighting like all things that can go wrong um with the thyroid because of thyroid awareness month in in a few days so, you know, sitting, my mom tried to keep me as calm as possible. Um, I went in fairly quickly. Um, the attending nurse or the assistant for the pathologist was very, very sweet. She had put on music that I requested. Um, I, she asked me if I liked Taylor Swift, which I do love Taylor Swift. She's one of my favorite artists. She had put that on to kind of make me feel a little bit better. And then after waiting for about five minutes, the pathologist came in and um, the pathologist was excellent. He is a very thorough um, doctor to the point where he basically discarded my old sonogram results, um, ultrasound um, results, and wanted to take all fresh ones. You know, he wanted to see exactly what he was working with. Um, so he had taken more um, ultrasound images of my neck and unfortunately his face kind of gave it away that something was wrong um which i know sometimes might come off as unprofessional but i i really didn't mind it it kind of made it a reality of what i was about to go through so and then, yeah. sorry, really quickly so okay. he he performed an ultrasound that day again the day, and the results were immediate no so he took a few ultrasounds just to see exactly where he wanted to take the the uh, biopsies from so, um, like I said, he's a very thorough person. So he basically was like, I don't want what was taken previously. I want my own images that I'm taking. I need to see exactly what I'm working with. So after he had taken a few more images, he knew exactly, he marked where he was going to stick the um, needle into. So the ultrasound though, he was able to see right then, it was mm -hmm. the same day, right? So he just, mm -hmm. same day results in terms of seeing what he was working with. 
Is that mm-hmm. right? Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, he basically had told me, you know, you don't have, you know, like one or two nodules on your thyroid. You have about three masses, which is a much scarier word than, than a nodule. So by his facial expression, um, expressions and by what he was telling me, I pretty much felt at that point that they were going to tell me that, that I had cancer. So, um, next order of business was the actual biopsy. And it, (laughs) needle is very, very long. (laughs) It's very thin, but it's very, very long and it's very scary. Um, for someone that has never really gone through anything medical besides donating blood or getting some blood work taken. Um, but he was a, he, he's a very, very sweet man. You know, he was making jokes while, um, while uh, doing the biopsy to make me feel better. It wasn't really a true pain. It was more of like pressure. I don't know if that's because that's how it's supposed to feel or if my neck was very tense. You know, the neck, believe it or not, is a very, very temperamental spot. Depending on if you feel nervous or if you feel tense, it's going to affect someone like working around your neck because of all the muscles and all of the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Muscles and all of the nerves that you have um, in your neck. So he had biopsied the three spots and he had gone straight over to an area where he had a magnifier and he had put the slides underneath the magnifier. And right then and there, he told me that I had um, cancer. Wow. Like all just, (laughs) how, how long did the biopsies take? You know, um, it was like bing, bang, boom, like (laughs) left, right, center kind of thing. And on a scale of one to 10, 10 being just extremely painful, one being nothing. How, how would you rate that pain? A six. Okay. Okay. But it was super fast. He just did one right after the other. Yeah, and like Taylor Swift was playing in the background. So I was like, what's happening? <laughs> right. Must have been so out of body. And yeah. and so he it was right there on the spot. He just took it over. He uh so how did he tell you? Do you remember how he told you and what you were feeling at the time? It's actually now that I think about it, I kinda laugh. And um he had came over to me and um he had held my hand and my mom was behind me holding um, my shoulder. And he said, um, you have cancer, but the good news is you're not going to die and you still need to wear a seatbelt. So at that point, I'm like, what is this man telling me that one, I have cancer, but two, I'm, I'm not going to die. How can he make me a promise like that? Just from looking at, um, a slide. And he had said to me, you know, with thyroid cancer, again, this is the stigma around it. You just have to get your thyroid out. You're going to be fine. Um, he's like, it's going to scar you a little bit, but at the end of the day, um, you're going to have your life and you're going to be fine. And I just want everybody to know that it's not that easy at all. And that there is a pretty sucky stigma around having the good kind of cancer, which I can definitely get into later. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. But after that, you know, um, I wasn't really crying because I was just in so much shock. And we had, oh, he he said to me, um, I need to examine the cells a little bit more to determine if it's stage one or stage two. He said that stage three and four don't really exist um, in the kind of cancer that I was diagnosed with, he told me right off the bat that I had a papillary um, thyroid cancer. So he said, I just have to determine based on the cells if you have a stage one or stage two. And um, I went home. Um, that was kind of a blur, you know, going home and, you know, your doctor telling you that you have cancer, but you're not going to die. And two, call me later so I can tell you what kind of stage it was. It was just such a casual conversation. Meanwhile, I felt like someone kind of punched me in the gut. Um, I had just turned 24, like six weeks before that. So, you know, I'm finally starting to, you know, like get my life together. And I'm like, okay, pause. We can't do that right now because I have to deal with this. 
So I had gone home and I had told my siblings um, that I had cancer and I had called my boyfriend. I remember I drove by myself to the boardwalk um, by the beach area um, where I live in Staten Island. And I kind of just sat there and then I finally, you know, decided to cry because there was no one else around me. So it just like all felt so surreal. Well, yeah. And it happened so quickly, right? Like one minute yeah. you're fine. The next minute someone's casually telling you, you have cancer, but you're not going to die. Um, how, yeah. yeah. Was there anything that you, did, I mean, in that case, I hear it's pretty straightforward. So was it even like a, a thought to get a second opinion? Um, and how did you make the decision yeah. on like where to go in terms of who to see for treatment? So um, I'll start with how I called um, the pathologist back later that night to find out the stage. So, um, I had called him and he had said to me, you know, you have stage two. Um, he said from the cells, it seems that it spread to a lymph node or two in your neck. So again, I'm panicking and I'm like, you know, why couldn't I have stage one? Like, why couldn't it just be contained just to my thyroid? I had known, um, someone that I had went to high school with that had the same thing and how hers was just stage one. So of course, you know, like envy comes over my face and I'm pretty much crying all night. And before I got off the phone with the pathologist, he said, you know, um, I really would recommend that you go to um, Sloan Kettering. And he had given me the name of the surgeon, Dr. Wong. And um, I told my mom, what he had said on the phone. And then we had realized that about six months before that, maybe five months in July, my aunt had her thyroid removed. She is a 9-11 um, first responder. So they had found that she had kind of like a precancerous, um, she had some precancerous cells on her thyroid that they said, you know what, let's take out right away. So, you know, we have it now. Um, we know that this is 9-11 related. Let's get it taken out. And she had gone to Dr. Wong. So we had remembered, okay, that's two people so far that have recommended Dr. Wong. And my mom had said to me, you know, I know you're very independent. I know you're 24 years old, but let me call Sloan and let me set up the appointments. So that was the morning of December 28th, which is actually my boyfriend's birthday. So it was very surreal finding out you have cancer and then going to bed and then having to wake up and making sure that your boyfriend still has a great birthday because you don't want anything to ruin it. And then while, you know, going out to dinner and while celebrating, having your mom be like, okay, great. I got you an appointment with Dr. Wong on January 15th which sounds like a long time, but um, to be able to get an appointment in less than two weeks with, you know, a top doctor at Sloan Kettering, I didn't really mind waiting because like I said, I was told I wasn't going to die. So um, I would say that those two weeks waiting from when I was, in, was initially diagnosed to having my first oncology appointment was probably the longest two weeks of my life. For sure. Before we go to the next section where I'm going to take a quick uh, pause for the recording, I want to ask that question. How did you, how did you manage to pass the time? Like, what's your advice to people? Because as we know, um, I went through treatment for, for cancer as well in 2017. As we know, there's a lot of waiting that can be involved, right? So yeah, what was, what's your advice to people who are waiting for treatment or waiting for test results? Keep busy. Definitely keep busy. Um, thankfully, I I was employed, um, full time job um, in Manhattan. So, you know, the funny part was that I had taken off all the way. I had taken off all of that Christmas break and New Year's, and I was saying to myself, "I'm gonna have such a great vacation." You know. Like I, um, I have the time off from work. It's going to be great. And the entire time off I had from work, I was going from doctor's appointment to doctor's appointment. So it was very ironic that it wasn't really a vacation at all. But the good thing was that 
in between those two weeks, I stuck to my normal routine. I went to work every day. Um, I concentrated on my work. I, you know, I still hung out with my friends. Um, just keeping to a, a routine is the most important thing because it just keeps your mind off of it. And keeping to that routine makes it seem like nothing's changed, nothing's different. You know, just keep powering through. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't change a thing. And I think that's what got me through those two weeks, even though they felt long, but thankfully my head was in the right place, so. Okay. Um, I'm actually, since you did that so quickly and so well, thank you for sharing that first part. I'm just going to go right into the actual treatment part of it. Um, Can I just take a quick drink of water? Yes, of course. So um, for the treatment, what did the, uh, was it the pathologist who told you what the next steps were in terms of, or it was that, that first meeting with Dr. Wong, right? So it was my first meeting with Dr. Wong. Um, hold on one second. This isn't creepy. This is me and Dr. Wong in glass. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Let me get a picture of that later. <laughs> so um, my first oncology appointment, um, again, it's just so weird being a younger person in a cancer center. Um, you know, like I said, just turned 24, just came back from uh, Atlantic City um, celebrating my birthday, and now I'm in the head and neck hospital at Sloan after finding out I had cancer. So I went with my mom, again, big shock, um, to meet Dr. Wong, and I had met with his nurse practitioner first, very sweet woman, her name was Jill. Um, she basically asked me, you know, a few questions, um, I guess just to report to Dr. Wong um, before he came in. And, you know, I kept it together. I didn't cry in front of her. I didn't cry in front of any other doctor, but in between them coming in and out, I just started like bursting into tears because like I'm one of those people, I don't like anyone seeing me upset. And I don't like to show my emotions as much as other people do. And I, maybe you, you can't tell now, but I'm very sarcastic and I like to laugh. So dealing with something like that while still trying to keep up my persona and my usual attitude so other people don't see me necessarily weak was another thing that was really trying during that time. So like I said, in between the nurse jill and the doctors coming in and out i was i would just look at my mom and i'd be like okay and then i would just start bawling um but i'd quickly get it back together when someone uh, knocked on the door because they were coming in and then i had met dr wong my hero um shortly after i had met with nurse jill and he is the best doctor in the world best surgeon in the world and he basically, um, you know, walked me through it. He told me, you know, um, he first, he said that the pathologist that had took the biopsies from me is one of his um, good colleagues. He recommends him completely. So that's when I knew I'm like, okay, so I'm on the right track with all of this. I went to the right person to get, um, to get the biopsy from now I'm at the right doctor's office. Like I felt in good hands, which was great because I had basically felt the safest I had in two weeks from my initial diagnosis to my first appointment. And he had told me, you know, um, you're going to have to get, um, a few more tests. We want to assess the entire situation. So he had walked me through, you know, you're going to get a CT scan of, your neck, you're going to get a CT scan of your chest, um, you're going to get more blood work. And then he said to me, no, we need to set a date for your operation. So me just being casual, I'm like, well, this day doesn't work for me. It's Super Bowl Sunday and uh, my godson's birthday is on Valentine's Day. And he, he, he like, you know, like we were making a joke about it. He's like, okay, so you tell me what's good for you kind of thing, which like really made me feel at ease just to be able to have a casual conversation about something so serious. 
And then that's when we had decided on February 8th for my uh, surgery date. And I would have to go get those tests done to assess the extent of the disease um, on January 25th, I believe. So um, I had left the appointment very, very confident because I was very comfortable with Dr. Wong. Um, I was a little scared about having to get CT scans and whatnot because I had never gotten anything like that done before. I, you know, knock on wood before this, I was never really sick. You know, don't get me wrong. Like I've, I've had mono, I've had, you know, flu, I, you know, I've, I've, I've had sicknesses before, but not to this extent. And I never had to get an MRI or anything like that. Um, and I'm claustrophobic. So I was like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? How am I going to sit still? Um, so can you describe each of those? Each oh, one of course. the procedures? Yeah. So we had went back to Sloan um, about a week later. And um, I'm a... Um, I'm a Manhattan person, so I'm cracking jokes with my mom, and I'm like, great, after we do all of this, let's go to Carmine's, maybe we can go see a show, we like, let's, let's go do something fun, trying to distract myself from the fact that I'm going to have to get stuck in a CT machine for God knows how long, so, um, you know, you go in, again, being younger is automatically off-putting, and then having to go into the changing rooms to, you know, to disrobe, take off all your jewelry, um, and seeing other sick people that are more sick than you is just very devastating. I, I knew that I wasn't going to have to get chemo because Dr. Wong had told me that right away. He said, with your kind of thyroid cancer, which is the most uh, common form of thyroid cancer, we don't treat with chemotherapy. We treat with um, radioactive iodine. So, you know, automatically you feel so guilty because you have cancer, but you don't have a severe form of cancer like someone, you know, that God forbid has lymphoma, that has breast cancer, that has leukemia, that you know that they have to go through chemo and you know that it's going to take such a toll on their bodies and they're still in the room with you and they're smiling. And it kind of gave me like a sense of guilt in a way, like, how could you be so upset when, when there's people around you that have it so much worse than you kind of thing, which by the way, is not a great mindset to have all the time, but I can get into that later. Um, so I was all ready to get my CT scans done and I never had contrast before. So they said to me, you know, we're going to put the IV in for your contrast. I, I thought that you drink contrast from like, past family members being sick. I know that when they had to get scans, they had to like drink some Gatorade concoction. So I was a little freaked out when they put the IV in and then they put the contrast and they said, you know, in five minutes, you might feel like you have to use the restroom, but it's just the contrast going through, through your body. So don't get nervous. So um, everyone at Sloan is so friendly, even down to security and the custodians. Everyone is just so great. They have such great demeanors. They're so friendly. And uh, they walked me into the room with the CT machine, which is kind of intimidating. It's like a big dome and you have to lay down. And uh, I, I had laid down on the, um, on the bed too. The bed is, is a weird term on the, all right, we'll just say bed because I can't think of a better word. But um, so I laid down and then I thought about what the nurse had told me, you know, if you feel like you have to go to the restroom, don't freak out. It's just the contrast working. So that was just the most bizarre feeling ever. And then um, I, they put me into the machine, you know, slowly going in and I'm so nervous at this point and I feel like I have to use the restroom, which is horrible. And uh, they tell you, don't breathe, don't move, because you're going to mess up your uh, CT results. You know, the longer you don't comply, the, the longer you kind of have to be in this thing. So it was just bizarre that I'm laying in this CT machine and 
I'm laughing because I have to use the restroom, but then I'm crying because of the situation I'm in because the the CT machine is this close to my nose. And like I said, um, I'm uh, claustrophobic. So I'm like, this is just so um, bizarre right now. And those CTs lasted about 25 minutes each. Felt like a lifetime. Because like I said, again, I'm laughing, I'm crying. They're, they're, they keep telling me, don't breathe, don't move. Um, so finally, when I was done, they were like, okay, call your doctor. Um, this was a Saturday. They said, call your doctor Monday. If he doesn't get back to you um, early that morning. And I just said to them, you know, I'm so sorry. I was, I was so annoying. I promise I'll be uh, better next time. And like I said, everyone there is so friendly. So again, not really thinking about what results I was going to get, but more of a, okay, this is done now. Next step is talking to my surgeon again and then pre-testing and then actually getting my surgery done. So Again, I, I left pretty confident because again, I, I felt like I felt safe, like I was in the best hands. So that's a great feeling. I'm glad you, you felt so confident in that. Um, yeah. so you had two, you had two CT scans done that day, two separate ones, mm-hmm. uh, why two, separate ones. two separate ones and then no MRI, just the two CT scans. Just, just the two CT scans. So, um, I'm not exactly sure why I, I think. Yeah. You oh, don't, all right. Oh, yeah. That's coming back to me. I, I had gotten the one of the head and the neck, and then one of the chest because the pathologist said that the cancer was stage two. So they were trying to assess any kind of um, metastases that were going to be th- past the thyroid and possibly um, in the uh, upper chest. Okay. And so they said to call Monday a couple mm-hmm. days later. So did you call and did you get your results then? And what were they? So I actually did not call on the Monday. Um, I was so busy at work. I had set a reminder in my phone, you know, call Dr. Wong at 4 p.m. He had actually called me um, at noon that day. So, I, you know, I was so happy to hear from him again, happy that I didn't have to chase down the doctor for the results like I had to for my first sonogram. And he had said to me, and he has a very calming demeanor, um, very very monotone, very sweet voice. So he was basically telling me, you know, um, and he said this in in a nice way, but he was like, it's a little bit more aggressive than we thought. So I'm like, okay. Um, So basically he had said that he had confirmed what the pathologist had said that I had three masses on the thyroid itself. My entire left side of my neck had suspicious lymph nodes. Um, The right side had a little bit less than the left and the chest CT had showed that it had spread to lymph nodes in my upper chest. And I also found out that I have a nodule that's about the size of a pea um, on my right lung. So Dr. Wong told me right away, um, the surgery isn't gonna be two to three hours like we thought, like with a basic um, thyroidectomy. It's probably gonna be more on like the six to eight hour range. So at that point, um, you know, I'm, I'm in shock because I'm hearing this on the phone. And, you know, I'm writing down everything that he's saying so I can go back and, you know, tell my family and I could tell my friends. And he said, you know, it's going to be fine. Um, I'm not really worried about the spot that's on your lung because you're going to get radioactive iodine therapy. And if that turns out to be thyroid cancer, it's going to hopefully get wiped out by the treatment. He said, but it's, it's not really worrying me. It's a nodule. It looks pretty benign. Um, you know, he asked me, do I have any questions? And at that point, I'm, I don't even like, of course I have a bunch of questions, but I couldn't really think on the spot. And I was like, if, if I need to call you back, can I? And he said, of course, you know, he, he gave me his number and, and everything. And, um, I basically went to the bathroom in my office at my old office. I don't work there anymore. And I just started crying. I'm like, so this isn't going to be as easy as I thought. Dr. Wong had also told me that he was going to enlist the help of a thoracic surgeon 
at Sloan to basically assist him on getting the lymph nodes that were in the um, upper chest area, if, if needed, just to have him on standby. So I'm like, great, now I'm working with two surgeons and not one. This is not gonna be two to three hours. It's gonna be six to eight. And then he had mentioned that I was going to have to have drains put into my neck because of all of the lymph nodes that were involved. And you need the liquid drained from your neck because that liquid automatically goes to your lymph nodes. And when your lymph nodes aren't there, it's going to back up into your neck and it can cause infection and whatnot. So I was like, oh, great. This is really going to be something. now." <laughs> and then it also went from, oh, you're going to be in the hospital overnight to you're probably going to be in the hospital for three to four days. So again, feeling pretty defeated at that point, but still comfortable in the fact that I know I have the best surgeon I possibly can, and I know I'm going to get the best care that I can. So that was on January 30th, and um, then I had to get my pre-testing done the next day. Okay. Which, yeah, what's, the, what's pre-testing? <laughs> so basically to make sure you're okay to, to get surgery, um, I had gotten an EKG, and I had gotten a bunch of blood work done, um, they were like, we want to confirm that, you know, you're not pregnant and whatnot. And I'm like, I, I would have told you, um, if I was, <laughs> I definitely know I'm not, but we can check it out anyway. And, you know, they check all your levels. Um, I didn't really know what I was reading when, when they had given me my blood work results, but basically they just give you your EKG, um, to make sure that your heart's okay. Check any other levels like your, uh, cholesterol, um, you know, your white blood cells, your red blood cells, and, um, another, like, kind of ironic thing was that the woman that had did my, my EK, that had done, um, my, uh, EKG was like, you know, aside from the thyroid cancer, you're in pretty perfect health, and I'm like, thanks, <laughs> don't need to be reminded, um, because clearly I'm not in perfect health, that's why I'm here. Right. Um, kind of insensitive right. but yeah. I know she was trying to make me feel better nothing against her but so, let um, me let me pause you right there um mm -hmm. just because I'm gonna start the and then you can get another swig of water <laughs> um just I'm gonna start a second recording here just because we've hit I have to call <laughs> it went down the wrong pipe I'm fine oh. <laughs> take your time <laughs> Yeah, take your time. You have. I'm not to, used to talking this much. I know. We'll we'll, make it, we'll try to go through the next part. And by the way, at the very end is where I'll ask about the like emotional mental part. So, this is just all about the the process, really. Mm -hmm. Um. So let's see here. Okay. So if you could, uh, very quickly, the EKG is pretty simple, right? If you could just describe that for people. So getting an EKG is um just to check you know, the rhythm of your heart, I guess. Um, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know if I'm explaining that correctly, but um, they basically take, you know, a few of those little sticky things and they put them on like various parts of, um, of your chest and on your belly too, which is like kind of uncomfortable because you have to, you know, lift up your shirt and you're like, oh, don't look at me. But <laughs> Um, it literally takes under a minute and then they print out this long paper and they check and make sure that everything's okay. Um, everything was kind of in a rhythmic pattern for me. So, um, I know I, uh, I've gotten EKGs before, so I basically knew what to expect. Um, you know, thank God there's nothing wrong with my heart. I don't have, um, an irregular heartbeat. So that, so I was pretty relieved when I got that sheet but like I said very very painless maybe the, the little sticky things uh kind of pinch a little bit when they come off but that's it okay perfect so pretty simple and straightforward mm -hmm. you were good with the pre-testing um and then the surgery was scheduled for how far out like a month later or what was the so this was January 30th when I got the pre-testing done and my surgery was on February 8th Oh, wow. Okay. So pretty quickly um, done. Can you describe just the process of that day going to the hospital um, and how they prepped you for surgery and then what you remember coming out of it? So um, going in for the surgery, um, 
I was automatically annoyed because you can't drink and you can't eat. So the night before I made sure I had my favorite pizza and my favorite food. And then the next morning I woke up um, 5 a.m. I had to, my surgery was scheduled for 10. So I had to be at the hospital by 7.30 or 8 o'clock. Um, so to get from my house in Staten Island to Sloan Kettering with no traffic is about a half hour. So I went with like a whole brigade of people. I had my sister and my boyfriend and my parents and my aunt. Um, and we all went to the hospital. So imagine my embarrassment walking in with like this whole brigade of people behind me. Um, so going in, you know, checking in, it was just a surreal feeling, you know, like giving your name again, giving your birthday again, because they always have to check your name and date of birth to make sure it's you. That's just um, medical um, procedures. So I walked in and they said, okay, we're going to go straight into pre-op. And again, no waiting. So I went straight in and, you know, you have to take off all your jewelry. You can keep your cell phone um, on you until you have to get wheeled in. And um, they pretty much, they prep you for the IV that you're going to get. They don't actually give you the IV yet, but they um, get the port ready for it. They give you that rock and hospital gown and the little comfy socks. And you basically just chill and sit on the bed and answer nurses' questions until it's time for them to wheel you in. And um, I remember I was, people were coming in and out, you know, because you can't have too many people in pre-op with you at one time. And my godfather had actually come all the way from the Jersey Shore to sit with my family while I was getting um, my operation. So he would come in and then my dad would come in and it was just like a revolving door of people. Um, my brother had surprised me and he had left work to, to come wish me good luck. Um, I was getting a few phone calls and then they had said to me, you know, we're going to wheel you in in five minutes. And then that's when it was like every emotion in that six weeks that I was bottling inside just came like crashing down. Um, I started hysterical crying. It was like one of those things where I said to myself, I, I'm finally coming to terms with what's happening to me. And even though people are telling me that I have, you know, the good cancer, I still have stage two cancer and I still have to get a major surgery done and I still have to get treatment and it's going to be a long road to recovery. And all of those feelings just hit me at once to the point where I'm sobbing uncontrollably. And I told the nurse, you, you have to go get um, Dr. Wong. And <laughs> I remember she ran off to go get um, Dr. Wong and he had come running down the hallway <laughs> and he wasn't in his scrubs or anything yet. He was in plain clothes and he basically sat at my pre-op bedside and he held my hand and he calmed me down before I had gotten wheeled in to the operating room. So I kind of delayed my operation by about five minutes because I had a little bit of a uh, meltdown. But again, just reassuring me that everything was going to be okay, that he was going to get everything that he could visibly see, and just making me feel as comfortable as I could in the past six weeks. And um, he had told me the next time I see you, you're going to be awake, um, and you're going to be on the road to um, recovery. So again, I, find, I felt okay. And I had gotten wheeled into the OR um, with, I remember looking behind me and seeing my mom and my sister and my boyfriend, kind of like waving, <laughs> see you later <laughs> kind of thing. And then next thing I remember was just going straight into the operating room and I'm sniffling a little bit, I'm crying and, uh, Everyone was just, all the nurses and the anesthesiologists were just so sweet, you know, calming me down, rubbing my hand, you know, kind of telling me, you know, everything's going to be okay. You're about to have the best sleep of your life. And then they told me, count backwards from 10, and I got to eight, and then I went to sleep. Um, and then I woke up, 
it was nine o'clock at night. So my surgery started by the time, you know, you have your anesthesia, by the time the surgeon preps and everything, it doesn't start exactly at the time that they say. So I would say that my surgery probably started around 1045 and I woke up after eight hours of surgery and about an hour and a half of recovery at nine o'clock at night. And when I woke up, I heard like this suctioning noise. I maybe it was oxygen or some kind of tube that was in my throat. But um, I'm saying to myself in my head, "Wow, that really was the best sleep I ever had in my life." And um, I had woken up to see um, Nurse Jill, who I had met um, a week or two ago at Dr. Wong's office, and I was so happy to see her. And um, I went like this around my neck and I felt like the steri strips that were around it and I'm like I don't even want to know what, what this looks like um I had I was told that I wasn't going to have the little slit that most people get when they just get their thyroid out um I was told that I was going to have the uh the joker's uh smile across my neck I was going to basically be cut from ear to ear so um after that I remember my family coming in. I remember talking to my brother and my sister-in-law on the phone. And then I remember going up to my room and having a pretty painful um, first night. Yeah, I imagine because it was a major surgery. Yeah. Uh, when you woke up, were you in pain or were you still on, um, you know, some of the painkillers or... I was definitely still on the painkillers. The one thing that I had noticed immediately, aside from the, the pressure on my neck from the steri strips and from the incision, was um, the catheter. And, you know, it wasn't even a thought to me that I would have one put in. Um, like I said, I'm not a very medically savvy person. So I'm like, why do I feel so much pressure? And then I had, I had, seen what was you know going on and the first thing I said to the nurse I'm like you you have to take this out I'm like I promise I can use the restroom by myself kind of thing and I had noticed that when I had gone up to use the restroom that I forgot I had those drains in my neck so I looked like Frankenstein I had like two bolts coming out of my neck and two drains that were like little apples so I couldn't move my neck because you know, I just had an eight hour operation and I have a huge 12 inch incision on it. So the pain of trying to get up was the most excruciating pain I've ever had in my life. I'm not going to say it was a 10. It was more of an eight. Um, but that was like, getting in and out of bed the first time was like, wow, I never want to go through an operation like this again, because, you know, you don't think of it all the time, but your neck is really important. So when you can't move properly and, you know, you're coming out of anesthesia, it's like, so how do I move back and forth again? How do I get out of this bed? Do I slide down? Um, so it was a very fun first night. Um, my mom stayed with me the whole time. Shocking. I know. Um, but one thing that I kind of prided myself on was that I wouldn't take the highest pain meds that they were giving me. I think I do, I, I'd like to think that I have a really high pain tolerance. Um, so, you know, they would offer morphine, I didn't want it. They would offer Percocet, I don't want it. Um, I had, I had taken a Percocet when I was in the hospital and I didn't like the way it made me feel. It made me feel very loopy. Um, I didn't feel like myself. Um, and at one point, I, it's probably from coming in and out of anesthesia and being on a painkiller, but I could have sworn I saw like one of the pictures on the walls, like moving. It was a picture of an elephant and I'm like, Oh my God, the elephant's charging at me. <laughs> so at that point I'm like, I, I'm, I'm done with these. Um, I said, what else can you give me? And they were like, how about some extra strength Tylenol? So I said, okay, that'll work. Um, I would say that the pain was about a six or a seven. Um, you know, nothing that I couldn't handle. Um, but the last painful part, now, 
the day after my surgery was a Friday. So I was in the hospital um, Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, and I got discharged Sunday afternoon. So the basis around getting discharged was the amount of output from the drains. Um, thankfully, I didn't have a lot of output ever. So on Sunday morning, um, Dr. Wong had come in to talk to me. He had come in previously, not, not just three days later, but just to talk and whatnot. And he had looked at the drains and he said, well, good news, you get to go home today. Let's get these drains out and let's get you on your way. Um, the drains, getting those removed was the most painful part of it because you don't realize how deep these tubes are into your neck. And it was one of those things where um, I had seen my mother, like her face when they were um, removing them. And it was just like one of those things where it's like a never ending string coming out of your neck. And by the time it like actually came out, I was like, wow, that is the most painful part of this entire thing, followed by the biopsy, then followed by the actual pain from the surgery. It was so, it felt so backwards. But those drains, to anyone that ever has to get them put in, they're so gross. They're, they're not fun at all. I remember my brother, who's like really queasy, he had looked at me when I had them. And of course you're holding them up because they're stitched to your neck. And he ran away. He's like, I have to go check on something. And I found him down the hall because he couldn't look at them because of, you know, it being stitched in your neck and whatnot. But something you said like Frankenstein's monster, right? Um <laughs> and it was like having like another pair of boobs, you know, just like holding them up for lack of a better word. Sorry if that's inappropriate. But um I'm basically walking around, you know, and it's like I want these things out. So when I actually got to get them taken out on Sunday, I was super relieved because at that point I thought I was going to be in the hospital until Monday, you know, cause they said three to four days and I'm banking on the worst possible, um, stay. So I got those taken out and, uh, actually then, for, for people who, um, have to deal with drains, mm -hmm. is there anything in hindsight that you wish you had known about them or just anything at all that you think might help other people going into it? read whatever book or instruction sheet or fact sheet that they give you about drains. Um, it's very, it's very uncomfortable, but you have to remember that it's temporary and they're going to come out and you have to remember that you need them. You know, it's, they, they make sure that everything is functioning properly. They avoid you getting an infection. They avoid that, that lymphatic liquid from building up in your neck so while it may feel very uncomfortable you just know that they're not there for for just any reason you know your doctor knows what's best like I said it's very temporary and um and just those trying to get through it I'm sorry go ahead try to get through it yep no that's it and then um those those drains yeah like those drains you were saying they kind of um you said like two apples could you describe sort of so it was like two pouches, like it's tubes that are going into two parts of your neck either side and they drain each into like a pouch or something or? So mine was more of a cylinder. Um, and it, it has like a, it's connected with the tube into the cylinder and there's like a suction cup on each side that you can prop open and discard the drainage. Thankfully I didn't have to do that, um, the nurse did. But um, like I said, it's it's all discharge. It's not the most pleasant stuff coming out of your neck. So just try not to look at it too much. Try not to get upset. Just know that it's something, you know, the drains are doing good. They're taking out something that's really not supposed to be there. And at the end of the day, you know, protecting you from infection. So while right. they do seem annoying, just know that they're kind of essential. Right. And like I said, they're, they're temporary. They're, they're going to come out. Just try and make yourself as comfortable as possible with them. That's a great and Don't point. forget that they're there because you have to kind of hold them or you can like, you can like tag them to you, but don't forget that they're there because it'll pull down and you'll be like, oh, that's painful. <laughs> okay. Very good perspective and advice. Thank you for that, Jenna. Um, so how you went home, how long did it take? How many days was it until you finally felt quote back to normal from the surgery? So, don't mean to be a buzzkill, but um, 
I came home three and a half days later. So um, they had sent me home with the pain medication again, the Percocets and whatnot, me being too proud, like the extra spent Tylenol is fine. So um, I would say I couldn't lay down. You can't lay down right away. You have to sleep and sit um, reclined. So that's incredibly uncomfortable because who wants to who wants to fall asleep and have a good night's sleep propped up in you know in, in a chair like this all night when you can't move your neck and you can't really move it you, you can't tilt your head back because you have a fresh incision um, you pretty much have to stay in place so try, I didn't have a good night's sleep for close to two and a half weeks um, I was sent home with instructions you know like little um, physical therapy guides from Dr. Wong's office yeah. to gradually, you know, do exercises with, with your, with your neck, with your face, you know, move from side to side a little bit every day. Um, do like these funny things with your mouth just to make sure, you know, cause everything's connected with nerves and, um, and muscles, you know, do the mouth exercises and whatnot, you know, try and do these things like three to four times a day. Um, I went back to work three and a half weeks after my surgery, which was a big, um, big mistake on my part. Um, at that point, I wanted to get out of the house. I didn't feel true job security. So like I said, I'm a very independent person. I wanted to go back to work right away just to make sure that I still had a job to keep my independence and just to get back to my normal um, routine. So I had gone back to work after three, three and a half weeks and um, I worked half days because I didn't want to tire myself. Um, but to really feel back on my feet again, it took about a month because when you have your thyroid removed, um, you have to go on um, hormone uh, replacement for the rest of your life to make up for all of the hormone that you're losing. Because people don't realize, not everyone knows what a thyroid is, but your thyroid basically controls everything in your body from your metabolism to your hormones um, to your weight. So getting used to being on the Synthroid was a very big challenge that I still kind of face almost two years, well, well past um, two years later. And, you know, I don't want to scare anyone, but you really never feel the same way that you did before you had your thyroid removed. It's not bad, you know, but at the same time, it's, it's just different. You're, you're on a medicine that's meant to replace, an, you know, a gland that has so much control over your body and you have to stay on it for the rest of your life. You have to take it every day as instructed. You have to take it every day in the morning, your Synthroid. Um, when you first wake up with a full glass of water, you can't eat or drink for an hour because you need the hormone to absorb in your body. So sometimes feeling my best is something that I still kind of struggle with to this day, but I would say in total terms of recovering from surgery physically, about a month, um, and then I had my back. I'm sorry? Oh yeah, I just, I wanted to, so that's great, and I want to be able to dive into the mental and emotional parts of it, but I'm looking, we have 15 minutes at most left, and I talk a lot. So so sorry. Hard to go through, that's okay, no, not at all, it's been really helpful actually, Jenna, um, so I do want to make sure that we hit the, you did do the radioactive yeah. iodine therapy, could you sum up the important parts of what that entailed? So the radioactive iodine therapy is, was basically my replacement of chemo. That was to make sure that every, every leftover piece of thyroid cancer that is in my body got wiped out. So getting radioactive iodine is a very intricate process. Um, I'm going to try and go through it as quickly as I can. So about nine days before you actually get the treatment done, you have to go on this horrific, strict, low iodine diet. And 
Um, you can't have any salt, really any seasonings whatsoever. I couldn't eat my favorite vegetables um, and I'm a vegetarian. So the only thing that I was able to eat was like unsalted meat. And obviously I wasn't gonna eat that. So I lived off of like Thomas's English muffins and unsalted almond butter for nine days. Um, it's three days of treatment technically because you have to get pre-hormone shots um, and you have to get scans before and you have to get scans after. What kind of scans? Full PET scan. So they basically want to assess if there's any visible tissue left. Thankfully, in my case, it was all microscopic and it was just left in the thyroid bed. So I had no visible um, thyroid cancer cells in my chest, thank God, which had a lot of cancerous lymph nodes. And uh, just to touch on that, I had 86 lymph nodes taken out in addition to my thyroid and more than a quarter of them came back uh, cancerous. So the fact that we were able to get all of that out, well, not me, I was asleep, but Dr. Long and his team were able to get all of that out and have my tumor marker incredibly low before the iodine was just a miracle. Just, I'll go over it quickly. Um, my endocrinologist at Sloan had said that it would be a miracle if my tumor markers came back under 100 because of all of the um, metastases that I had and my tumor marker before the treatment came back at four, um, which was amazing. Yeah, so just back to the treatment. Um, you're starving at this point because you can't eat a lot. Um, and you know, you go in and it's this totally surreal experience because you have a whole team come in with the iodine in this like kryptonite box that when you turn it, it like let out like this steamy liquid kind of thing. And it was like a box inside of a box inside of a box, which finally revealed this tiny little iodine pill. And you have to have a whole team watching you and you need a radiation specialist with this little uh, radiation tracker to make sure that it went down all the way. So I remember I, I had taken the pill and I had gloves on because like I said, this is radio, it's, it's radioactive and I had to be by myself and I took the pill and I had said bottoms up because I'm just an awkward person and I didn't know what else to say. And um, they checked to make sure that it went fully into my stomach and you kind of have to sit and drink a lot of water for about three or four hours and then you get discharged but you have to stay away from um you have to be arms distance apart from people for about 48 hours and you have to drink a lot of water because um whatever iodine that didn't uptake to the cancer cells you have to flush out so i remember i drank like probably like 25 bottles of water in two days. Wow. Um, like I said, very anticlimactic, just kind of swallowing a pill, but still having to follow all of those guidelines. Were there any side effects to the pill? So thankfully there are no major side effects. You know, it doesn't, thankfully doesn't mess with um, a female's uh, fertility. I would assume the same is for a male. Um, you know, the one side effect that I was told that I could have is permanent dry mouth. They said it's very rare. It only happens in like 0.1% of cases, but just my luck. I have the permanent dry mouth. Um, so, I mean, if that's the worst that could happen, it, it's okay. You know, when you're lucky, you're so super lucky. Yeah. Right? Um, so really quickly, um, because I do want to go into the mental and emotional parts of this as well. Mm -hmm. um, you, so the surgery happened, then you had the radioactive iodine therapy like in May. a year later or? No. So in May, oh. I had the radioactive iodine. It, it was a three day process with all of the, like the, the pre-hormone shots and whatnot. So and they had gotten the actual iodine. iodine are like you self-administered or they give it to you? Like the nurse gives it no, to you? They gave, no, they give it to you and they give it to you on your backside, which is <laughs> very fun. But- um, And how many of them? I had two. Sure. So I had them two consecutive days and then I had got them the final day of the treatment. I had gotten the, the PET scan prior to the treatment. 
took the treatment, went home that Friday, and then the Monday was when I had to go back for another scan. And then that was May 21st, and then they had called me on May 24th to tell me that the treatment was um, 100% successful and that I was cancer-free. Woo! <laughs> How did it feel in that moment, right? Like, Oh, I cried like a baby. I called everyone in my phone book. I called my grandma. <laughs> First, I ran in the house uh, to tell my family. Um, really funny and quick, my one of my best friends had saved my screenshot that came across with my text messages that said, I'm cancer free. And she surprised me that New Year's and had put that as like one of her best moments from 2018 was getting my text message. So oh, that's so that's wonderful. Yeah. Everyone's celebrating with you. Um, mm -hmm. That was your first scan. How many, and I saw some of the dates, but how many scans follow up did you have to get? So because it is papillary thyroid cancer and because it doesn't grow as aggressively as other cancers in general, let alone other thyroid cancers, um, I haven't had to get another PET scan. Every six months I get a, uh, an ultrasound of my neck. Um, because if the cancer was to reoccur, which I do have a probably like a moderate chance of reoccurrence, um, it would reoccur in a lymph node. And thankfully, it's so slow growing that it wouldn't get as out of control as it was at first. So every six months for a sonogram, every six months to check my tumor markers, and every three months to check my thyroid function. And the tumor Which, markers and the thyroid function, are they blood tests? Yes, they're, they're blood tests. Thankfully, it's just one tube of blood, um, not, not too crazy. And Sloan is great, and they upload your results like pretty quickly on your portal. So I'm checking my, I'm checking my levels on the subway back to work, and, uh, and they're there already. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, so yeah. we just have, we have to wrap very quickly, but this is a really important part of the interview. I'd love to hear, um, so one, about the good cancer. I know there's a lot of guilt associated with that. Can you describe that? And then we have a, a, like two or three more after that. So if you could leave an update. I can wrap it up in seven minutes. Don't worry. So the thing about having the good cancer is that you're automatically shamed because most of the times, especially with my thyroid cancer, with papillary thyroid cancer, you don't need chemo, which is a major part of most cancer patients' lives. And uh, you automatically feel guilty because you're like, why am I crying? I'm not going to have to go through something like this. You know, I'm, I'm not going to lose my hair kind of thing. And you just feel terrible about complaining because I have that kind of mindset. There's always someone that has a tougher time than you. But then at the same time, you don't give yourself enough leeway. You're still sick. You're still going to a cancer center. You're still getting a surgery. I went from never having a surgery to having an eight hour surgery and a 12 inch incision on my neck, which you can kind of spot. It's gotten a lot better, but it's, it's like a, it's like a necklace. So your life, it, it does get changed. Maybe I didn't you know, have chemo, but I still went through hell kind of thing. And people really underplay what an important function your thyroid is. Before I had thyroid cancer, I just knew that, you know, the thyroid is shaped like a butterfly and it's in your neck and my mom's is bad. So she has to be on medicine for it. But it's just, it's so much more than that. Like, it's such a big part of you, you know, you like, like, I had touched on earlier, you expect a tiny little pill that's this big that you have to take every day. If you, you're, you're expected for that to just do everything for your body that, that your thyroid did. And being on Synthroid, it's like a constant roller coaster because after two years, I'm, I still feel like I'm not on the right dosage. And that's something that my team at Sloan works with me on constantly. But thyroid cancer patients need to know that Maybe you're not having the toughest time, but you're still going through something. It's absolutely life-changing. It's not just you get surgery and, 
and you're fine after that. Like you have to adjust to an entire new life without having your thyroid. And that's what I want people that, that are going to be diagnosed with thyroid cancer to know. It's that you're, you're going to be okay in the long run, but you have to work to be okay. You have to have a strong mindset and you have to get used to this new life. But at the same time, you need to be thankful that you have your life. So as complicated as that sounds, um, you just have to be strong. And you just have to remember that the comeback is always going to be greater than the setback. So oh, That's so beautifully put. I love that. Um, you, you mentioned there, you still feel your dosage isn't right. What do you mean by that? So unfortunately, um, a lot of people like me, um, you know, you could be on too much thyroid hormone. You could be on too little thyroid hormone. For me right now, I've been on too much. So, um, I've been on, I'm on my second new dose of, uh, Synthroid in about six months. Um, you know, it's kind of a game and my, my, um, my doctor at Sloan says it too. You really have to find the perfect, um, dose. Unfortunately, I haven't found my perfect dose yet, but I know that I will, because like I said, I, I have a great team. What does that mean? Um, what does it, how does it feel, I guess, uh, to be on a too heavy of a dosage versus too light? I definitely prefer being on too light of a dosage, I'm going to tell you right now. Um, but being on too high of a dosage, you can get really bad palpitations. Um, you can be very, very anxious, um, shaky. Um, you know, it's not a good feeling. Whereas when you are on too high, you're very tired. Um, you know, you're sluggish and your weight is, is a big factor of it. Unfortunately, I've been struggling with my weight since, since I've, um, had my thyroid removed. Like I said, all temporary things, there's always, there's going to be a solution. It's not the end of the road. Um, thankfully when I go back, my, I had to get a, my blood work postponed because of the current, um, health situation worldwide, but, I have faith in the next time I get blood work that my doctor is going to know what to do. Wonderful. And, and with one minute, um, is there anything that you wish you had known, uh, questions you wish you had asked, um, tips, you know, for people who are about to go through this treatment? Tips. Um, I would say that tip wise, your mental recovery and the recovery of your spirit is a completely different ball game than your physical recovery. And you need to take time for both. You need to nurture yourself and you need to take care of yourself mentally just as much as you would physically. Because for me, it wasn't just, and it's still not just living with a 12 inch incision in my neck and a scar. It's just adjusting to a new life and trying to find, um, people that have been through the same thing as you and whatever mental health resources that you can get, um, definitely take advantage of them because there's no shame in, uh, in asking for help and just knowing that you're not alone. It's definitely the most important part because um, I don't think any cancer is good. So. That's very, that's true. Very well put. And Jenna, thank you so much. I don't know if we're going to get kicked off, but um, you shared your story beautifully. Um, I'm so happy that people are going to get to see your face and hear your voice and, and help guide them through what's not going to be very easy time. Um, I might send you an email with a couple of other timeline questions because you'd mentioned um, a couple other processes that you went through. Yeah, and I talk a lot, so it doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. And a couple of follow-ups. And then if you want to send me some photos, um, the more, the better, or if we just take them off your Instagram. Or oh no, I have plenty. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Send them over to me. The more, the, you know, the more human it is for people. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, I super appreciate it. And I will keep you posted. Things are, um, I'll keep you posted on terms of it, uh, when it'll come up, the story and how we can maybe keep working together because of course. you're a great face for this, you know, voice and face for this, uh, 
thyroid. I'm your thyroid gal. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. And of course it's two ways. So if there's anything that I can do, just, just, you know, hit me up. All right. Well, stay safe. You too. Crazy times. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but we'll be okay. Yeah, we'll be fine. Exactly. As you said. So, um, okay. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate it. And, and we'll be in touch. Yes.